Hey, what's up? Good morning. All right, all right. If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Hebrews. We'll be looking at Hebrews this morning. Hebrews chapter number four in our time together. Hebrews chapter number four. All right, you guys doing what? Doing right? You guys doing right? Anyone? Uh, not really. Okay, never mind. You know what? We're all doing horrible today, so it's my job then to carry the burden of helping you guys out a little bit. Hebrews chapter 4 in the scriptures this morning. Here we go. Um, so I almost did not become a pastor. Um, so when I was in college, um, I, I, I graduated with a college in pastoral studies. But to be quite frank, I almost didn't make it through. And, and that's not because I didn't get kicked out. I almost did several times. Um, yeah, so if I told you some of the stories that I did in college, you probably wouldn't be here at church anymore. Um, I was notorious in college for, for mischief. I, I remember one, one day we, I, I, um, we had curfews. I went to Christian college. And, and so at Christian college, there's a bunch of rules that are placed on us, all right? And some of these went to Christian college. You kind of know what I'm talking about. Like we had curfews that we had to be in. Um, I was notorious. I found a way to break out of the dormitory during curfew hours. And uh, that's what I did. I, I, I was the troublemaker in college. But, um, but I almost didn't make it through. So after my sophomore year of college, I, uh, I traveled across the country running youth rallies all across the, the I was in states like Arizona, uh, New Mexico, Texas, uh, Illinois, North Carolina, Florida, all over the place. And my job, I was hired by this, by this, um, by this ministry to go around the country and preach to kids, teenagers, and we held these youth rallies. Churches would invite kids all across the, their community to come into their church and have like a lot of fun and hear preaching. And I was, um, I was brought on board to do just that. So week after week after week, I would be teaching, ministering to kids, again, all across the country. And I did this for about four or three months during my, my Christmas break. And by the end of it, I was exhausted mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, in every facet, in every way. I was just drained. And so it was about two weeks until I head into my junior year of college. Uh, again, I'm in pastoral ministries, um, and so I starting to be a pastor. And I was just done. I was just physically exhausted. Do you ever realize that you should never make a decision when you're tired? Do you ever realize that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll let Arlene make the decisions. Here. Yeah. And so you never make good decisions when you're tired. And so I, in my exhaustion... I made the decision that I'm not going to go back into college. I don't want to be a pastor right now. I am so emotionally drained. And so I, I took my pastor out to coffee, and I said to him, Pastor, hey, you know what? Hey, um, thank you for, you know, what you've been doing for me, but I'm not going to go back to college. I, I, I want to do something else in my life at this point. I, I'm going to go pursue a different path. And then my pastor says, sure, you know what? You do whatever you want. You do whatever you need to. Just, man, take, make, take. You do what you need to do. Do you. And then shortly during those two weeks before school started, I realized, well, my car is still at college, so I have to go back and go get my car. I, I was living in Texas at the time. My college was in Arkansas, middle of nowhere, Arkansas. How did I end up in Arkansas? I have no idea. And, uh, but I had to go get my car, and then my friends were like, dude, you got to come back. You got to come back. And they're dogging me, and so I'm like, dude, I'm just I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I don't want to do this anymore. You know, man, I'm just, I need to hang it up for a, for a season. And basically, they conned me into coming back to school, and uh, I end up graduating. So I learned, and I loved it. Junior, the junior year, I began dating my wife, and uh, I have no regrets ever finishing. But then it reminds me, never make a decision when you're exhausted, emotionally, physically, spiritually. Maybe you find yourself here this morning, and I'm glad you're here, but you find yourself tired. Maybe a word we use in our vernacular is you are burned out. And you're at your wit's end. Maybe you're a mom in here, and you're getting ready to sell your children, perhaps. You're a spouse. And you're maybe thinking, this may be the 
straw that breaks the camel's back. Maybe you're a Christian in here and you're thinking to yourself, I'm just spiritually exhausted. I think I'm going to give this church thing a long pause. Maybe you've been out from work. You're just tired. Maybe it's time to turn in that resignation and maybe find another pursuit. And maybe that's you this morning. I don't know. But this, I, this thing of exhaustion and being tired is a real human feeling, a real human experience. The Bible talks about this. It talks about the weary. It uses the word Sabbath. Maybe you're familiar with it. Maybe you're not. It's considered one of the big ten, the Ten Commandments, right? But we don't do that, do we? You know, we, we, if I asked you what commandments do you keep, you would probably say, well, I, I, I try not to lie. You would say, I, I try not to, you know, I don't kill anyone. But, but Jesus even said, hey, if you hate someone in your heart, that you committed murder in your heart. And so you say, Pastor, I try not to hate people. I try to be kind and I don't steal. I, maybe I'm a kid in here. I try to honor my father and my mother. You know, I try to put God first in my life. I try to do this. I, I try and do that. But, but if I were to ask you, but do you try to rest? Some of you might say, Pastor, what's rest? Or maybe, maybe I see this one, and I watched, I watched my wife do this the other day, and I do the same thing. She says, hey, I need to go rest a little bit. And so you know what she does? She, and I have to pick up my wife. I do the same exact thing. She says, Mike, I need to go rest a little bit. Her rest was go, laying on, go sitting on our recliner at our home and getting her phone out. That's not rest. But so often we define that as rest, right? That's not rest. What is rest? We're going to look at, here, at that here this morning in Hebrews chapter number 4. The Bible uses the word Sabbath and so we're going to kind of tackle, does it apply to us today? And if it does or does not, what does that mean then for us today? And so I invite you to look with me at Hebrews chapter 4 this morning. If you don't have a Bible, you can just follow along. But I'm speaking to you guys. I know a lot of you are tired here. I know that you're exhausted. And so I pray and I hope that today's message just seeps down into your heart and that you take a lot of what is said this morning and you hide it in your heart. Hebrews 4, verse 1. We're going to go through verses 11 rather quickly now. But over the course of it, I'm going to elaborate on a couple things. But I hope you can stick with me now as we'll be working through, through verses 1 through 11. But we'll be kind of just taking it in a crash course. Here we go. Therefore. Now, I understand that we're therefore. I should maybe take a few seconds to kind of go backwards a little bit into chapter 3, which we looked at last week. In chapter 3, we see the author of Hebrews refer back to the children of Israel, right? If you recall last week's sermon, back in Hebrews chapter 3, the author re alludes to the fact that, remember, that when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, which was a miracle in and of itself, how God miraculously brought them out of Egypt and he's bringing them through what we call the wilderness or the desert and he's leading them towards the promised land. He's leading them towards a place where they will find refuge and peace and contentment and joy and all these things. But on the way, if we recall, the children of Israel began to complain and whine. Because again, what were they missing? They were missing the big picture like we talked about last week. Because in the midst of life, it's so hard to remember the big picture because we so are so focused on the issues that are so minute, are we not? We forget the big picture that God is doing a work in and through. We forget the big picture that God is faithful and God is awesome. And yet, like a small object being held up to your eyes, we begin to make these small things into rather large things. And so when he says, therefore, he's referring back to those people. So look at verse 1. Therefore, while the promise of entering into his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Some of your versions say experience it. 
experience what? The rest that is found in God. Verse 2. For good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard, get this now, did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. That right there is a sermon in and of itself. See, God has promises in his word. God issues to you and I promises. But though they're just that, they are promises. Promises need to be clung to. They need to be clinged to, right? God says this, but you and I must follow through by faith and say, God, I cling to your promises. I cling to what your word says. I'm by faith. I, I hold on to it. I implement it or I make it a part of my life. See, this promise of rest was promised to the Jews back then as it is us to us today. But the thing is, we say, Pastor, why don't I feel rest? Because you're not clinging on to the promises that God is going to make to us now in this passage. Verse 3, for we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, I as, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Again, God did not tolerate their behavior, their lack of faith. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Verse 4, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, as God rested on the seventh day from all his works and again in this passage he said they should not enter my rest verse 6 since therefore it remains for some to enter it and those who formerly received the good news fail to enter because of disobedience again he appoints a certain day today saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted today if you hear his voice do not harden your hearts for if Joshua had given them rest, again, Joshua is the leader of Israel, and he's leading them towards the promised land. He's leading them towards rest. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. He's referring to a day of true rest that would come. Because the rest that Joshua was leading them towards, them towards was a promise. It was a foreshadowing of the true rest that they would find in Christ. Verse 9. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered into God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Let's stop right there. So in this passage, we see Jesus, or excuse me, God referred to, or the author here referred to, a rest. We know it today as called a Sabbath. We see the Sabbath take place all the way in since the book of Genesis. God gave us an example. We know that God in six days created everything that we have here today in the world. But yet we find something really particular or peculiar. Because God on the seventh day then rested. Now, the question people often ask me sometimes is, Pastor, why did God rest on the seventh day? Was God tired? I mean, I didn't know that God could get tired. And my answer is to them is no, God did not need to rest, but rather he did that as an example for you and I, saying, Hey, you guys need to rest. And, and so he echoes this all throughout the Old Testament. Again, who in the Old Testament is God often writing to? He's writing to farmers, right? And so imagine you're a farmer now. You picture yourself in the Old Testament. You're a farmer. And you're hearing this idea of, hey, the, the six days, hey, gather all your crops. Or if you're a herdsman, you know, hey, do, run, tend to your cattle these six days. But on the seventh day, you guys are to rest. Now, why would God be so, in, why would God make it such a, a big deal for them to rest on the seventh day? Well, we say a glimpse of the answer in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, we see a reason for the Sabbath. It says this Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. 
Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. So on the Sabbath day, they were not supposed to do anything whatsoever. They were not to tend to their field. They were not to tend to their flock. They were really to rest, to chill, and to hang out. That was the command on the seventh day. But why? There was a point to it. It says, you shall remember, moving on, that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. It was a meant to be a day where they set aside everything, all the noise around them, and say, hey, you take one day, and you go, and you just rest. But you don't just do nothing or rest. Hey, you take that one day, and you just focus on how good God has been to you guys. You take this one day, hey, and you remember, hey, what you were before. Because what were you guys? You were slaves, and you were nothing. And now look at all that you have here in the promised land in Deuteronomy. And you remember, hey, all the crops that you have, hey, who does that come from? From God. Hey, all the herds that you have, who did that come from? That came from me. Or anything that you have, word, no, you take one day and you remember how good I am. Because don't we need those reminders? I mean, isn't life busy? I mean, life is busy. Like everyone says that life is busy, right? It doesn't matter if you have no kids, five kids, whatever. No matter if you have a job or no job, everyone says to me, Pastor, I'm busy. Life is busy. So take one day, carve it out, and focus on the Lord. Kind of sounds like Sunday, does it not? But here's the thing. They were commanded to do nothing. So what does that mean for us today during the age what we call grace? Because we are no longer under the law. We are under what's called grace. We are under the law of Christ. So therefore, basically what that simply means is we are no longer Old Testament law. And hallelujah, praise the Lord, that is the case for us. <laughs> we are under the law of Christ. But does that mean we just throw out the whole entire Old Testament and say it doesn't apply to us today? Because there is great logic and great wisdom found in the Sabbath. Could it be you're burnt out because you don't rest? Could it be your mind is weary because you have forgotten the Sabbath? Could it be that you are just at your wit's end because you have failed to rest? You're going 100 miles an hour and you see no end in sight and you just keep going and going and going. See, here's the problem with our society today. Hey, we lift up hard workers, right? And rightfully so. But to the point where we encourage workaholics. We do. You get a group of guys around each other. And, and you say, hey, man, how's work? Man, I've been working, you know, 70 hours a week. Dude, that's crazy, man. That's good for you, you know? You know, you get in your, you get in your small groups. We, we don't look down upon this. You know, you get in your small groups, and, and you, know, you know what you don't ever hear in small groups? Man, just pray for me. Man, I've been murdering people. You know, just, goodness, goodness sake, man. I just, I just can't stop myself from just, I just, I see someone, I run them over, you know? <laughs> we, we don't, I mean, I hope you don't ever have that small groups. But you know what, you, what, you, and, but you know what you don't hear? Man, I've just been working my, my tail end off, just working, working, getting home late every night. Get up in the morning, go to work. Man, last thing, I get home late, kids are in bed. Oh, man, that's terrible. No one does that. Because as Christians, we have forgotten this idea that God commands us to rest. And not just physical rest, as I'm going to show you here in a few moments, but mental rest. Rest for your soul. I believe people are burnt out today because simply they're not resting. They're not implementing a Sabbath. And the thing is, yes, you're not commanded to Sabbath any longer, anymore. 
But that doesn't mean that I shouldn't strive to have a season, a, a time of rest in my life. And so this morning, what I'm going to do is earlier this year, I, I talked to you about how to take care of your body and your soul and your spirit. And, and it's so vital to do all of those in your life. And I kind of thought about doing that this week, of how to how find rest for your body, soul, and spirit. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you two means of rest this morning, but in hopes that you will then take these two things, implement them into your life, and thus you will find rest for your body, soul, and spirit. So two types of rest that I find in the scriptures that I want to walk us, our church through this morning. Number one, the first type of rest is what I call peace with God. Peace with God. We're going to look at Romans chapter 5, verse 1 here this morning. Romans 5, 1, the Bible says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace. And, I, and when you see this word peace, you're going to see in this verse and one later on, I want you to think of also the word with it, the word rest. Because so therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now how does this work into this rest in our lives? Well, I'm so glad you asked. But first of all, hey, what does it mean to be justified by God? For those of you who are in Christ, meaning this, you have placed your faith in trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. You are not depending upon your good works. You're not depending upon your goodness or how bad you are, whatever. You are depending upon Jesus and Jesus alone for your salvation. You are in Christ. And thus, if you're in Christ, you have been justified by Christ. That word justified, the best definition I can give you is this. Just as if I never sinned. That's what justified means. So when you come to Christ, Christ forgives you of all your sins, past, present, and future, and he declares to you, hey, you are now justified. I look upon you, and I don't see your sin, but rather I see that my son has died on the cross for you, and your sins are no more, and I look upon you as just as if you never sinned. That's what justified means. And as justified, we have now peace with God. We have peace. We have rest. Meaning this. This is awesome. It means the opinion of the one who matters most has already been decided upon you. Because to God, he says, you're, you're good. And here's so why it's so important that you understand this. Because how much energy mentally and emotionally do we spend trying to find approval in the eyes of others? Right? I mean, let's just talk, let's, let's just talk straight now. How many of us buy things so that others will look at us and say, hey, look what they got. I, I found it funny this way. Someone once said, you know, the often we buy, we spend money we don't have to impress people we don't like. You ever find that's interesting? So, and, and so in order to find approval of others, I got to dress a certain way, I got to drive a certain thing, I got to do a certain thing, I got to, we spend money we don't, and that's exhausting. Rather just having a word to keep up with other people, right? Whether it be your car, your, your home, or whatever the case is. Like, society says, hey, you should be living like this, or you should be living that way, and, you're, and you fall, hey, I, I got to find my acceptance in the way people think about me. And thus, I spend money to impress people I don't even, A, know, or B, I don't even like them. And I spend, and is that exhausting? Or how many of us on social media, we have to always post that, 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 that picture, and then soon after, we're always checking, how many liked it? Did so-and-so like it? Did, 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 oh, so-and-so did not like my post. Did, did they not see it? Oh, maybe I'll post something again tomorrow. And we're trying to live. Is he all smiling now? I know it. I know it's true. Now, I'll tell you what, that's why I deleted Instagram and Facebook off from my life. It's better that way. Trust me. It's better. But you're trying to live for the approval of other people. 
I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Hey, you got family members, right? Hey, maybe, maybe you wives, you have a mother-in-law who has these expectations on you, right? And vice versa. And you're trying to meet the expectations of other people. Man, and here's the thing. People are always changing their minds. And so, hey, what's good one day isn't great the next day. Trying to be a people pleaser is exhausting. But you think to yourself, but I got to meet the expectations of others. Or, or how about this one? Uh, I, my wife says to me, you know, I read this article the other day, 10 things to do to be a good mom. And she is talking about it. She says, Mike, I'm doing two of those things. And if I'm honest with myself, maybe half of one on a good day. Or maybe you're a dad in here, you read this article, hey, 20 things you should be telling your daughter on a daily basis. I read that article, and I think to myself, oh, crap. I'm doing, I, did I say crap in church? Sorry. Um, oh, stink. <laughs> oh, shoot. I don't know. Whatever. I can't save myself from that one now. All right. Oh, man. I'm, I'm saying but two of these things. Man. It's that parent mom guilt, right? It's that dad guilt. Or, or I, I read this article, hey man, five things you should be doing as a pastor of your church. Oh, not good. See, everyone has an opinion of what you should be doing, of how you should be living your life. And if you live your life in the, for the satisfaction and the approval of other people, you will live a life that is exhausted. You will be emotionally fried at the end of the day because you're so worried about other people. But you know why I like Romans 5.1? I like Romans 5.1. If you could put it on there again, gentlemen. I like Romans 5.1 because it says, Therefore, since we have been justified, it doesn't say, hey, you will one day be justified. No, no, no. It says, hey, you have already been justified. Meaning God's opinion on you has already been decided. And now because we have been justified, now we have peace with God. Man, you Christian, cling on to this. Why? Because as one person who used to consume himself with trying to live with the expectations of others, when you learn this truth, you will be so free. There's one phrase that I didn't learn until about 12 years after becoming a Christian, and I'm going to give it to you today. Because for the first 12 years of being a Christian, I, was, I had these, this weight of what perfection meant. And if you know my personality, if you know who I am, ask my wife, I'm a perfectionist. I hate flaws to the T, any flaw. Hey, if you can draw out flaws in my life, I'll tell you what, my list is twice as big as yours. And I used to think I had to be perfect in every way. I couldn't have that failure in me. I couldn't have that until I learned this. And it forever set me free. And I didn't learn it until about 12 years after becoming a Christian. I didn't even learn it in college. After four years of going to college, I never, it never stuck with me. Maybe I knew it, maybe I didn't, but it didn't stick with me. I'm going to give it to you today. And if you've been in the church for a long time, maybe you already know this. I hope you do. But after 12 years of being a Christian, there's something I learned that set my soul free. And it was this. There is nothing that I can do to make God love me any less. Nor is there anything that I can do to make God love me any more. And that set me free. I used to think to myself, well, if I, if, I, if I just do all the things I need to do as a Christian, maybe God will love me more, right? Or maybe the times that I screwed up, the times that I messed up, oh, man, is God mad at me? Is he going like, to, like, you know, strike me the lightning bolt? Is he, or, or is he going to cause my car to go out this week? Is, is he going to do something where maybe I just don't do well on my, my, my exam? Is he, is he, is he not going to allow that? I, I used to sell TVs in college. I was a salesman. And I used to think to myself, man, maybe if I didn't do what God, if I wasn't faithful to the Lord, maybe I wouldn't land those sales and close on those deals. And I used to be consumed with this idea of like, I got to do this to make God happy. I got to do this so that God won't be mad at me. 
And it wasn't until I learned that there's nothing that I can do to make God love me any less, nor is there anything I can do to make God love me any more, that set me free. Because who I am has already been decided by the Lord. I am justified. I now have peace with God. But you see how if you don't realize that, hey, your mind can be just focused on, I got to worry about this, I got to worry about that, I, I got to do this. The gospel sets one free. When one comes to the Lord in faith, by faith, they are forever set free. So you want to free your mind of worry and fear, of trying to meet the expectations of others. Remember who you are in Jesus Christ. And so for some of you, your Sabbath may need to look like this. Hey, reminding yourself on a daily basis of who you are in Jesus Christ. It might be something as silly as, hey, waking up every morning, looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, hey, I am not who others say I am. I am not what society says I should be. No, no, no. Who I am is what God has declared over me. I am justified. I am his child. I am loved. That's why I tell you guys, hey, spend, it's so vital, spend daily time in the word of God. Because you know what? Your flesh isn't going to remind you who you are in Jesus Christ. Like, your flesh isn't going to remind you, I'm a child. No, no, your flesh is going to remind you how short you fall. But it's the word of God that reminds you, yeah, you fall short. But it's God who has made up the distance. It is God who has saved you. It is God who has redeemed you. That's why I try to make it a daily routine every single morning to listen to preaching of other people, just reminding myself of who I love and who I serve, and that is the Lord. Surround yourself with daily patterns of the Word of God. And we talked about this earlier in the year. Again, listening to preaching, listening to good gospel music, and just surrounding yourself with just the Word of God in your life, just saturating your soul to free yourself of the worry and the stress and the expectations that others place upon you. Because what's going to happen if you don't implement those things into your life? Hey, by, by the end of the week, if not sooner, you'll begin to fall. Because right now you're thinking to yourself, oh man, pastor, this is good preaching, right? Like right now you're thinking to yourself, oh man, like God's warming my heart right now. But if you don't implement these things into your life, by the end of the week you're going to be thinking to yourself, oh, how dare they say that about me, right? Oh, they said this about me. Is it true? Oh, someone said that. I, I, I better be doing that in my life too. Because it's so easy to forget what you hear on Sunday. And, and in fact, I, I, I tell people this. You know, realize I preached a message on Sunday morning about loving your wife. And then I've gone home the next, I go, I got home, I go home that night and my wife and I get into argument. Like it's happened. But I need to set daily reminders to myself of who I am in Christ. So the first piece I want to talk to you about is the peace with God. The second piece is the peace of God. The peace of God. One word difference, but it is vitally important that we understand this next one. Peace of God. And for this one, I'm going to turn to Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 on the screens here. It says this, Do not be anxious about anything. Now, I always make this joke, but I love this joke. But I, I looked at that word anything in the Greek. And what does the word anything mean? It means everything, right? It means, hey, what you got going, going on at work. Hey, that's a, that's a part of anything. That, hey, my kid's driving me crazy. Yeah, that falls under anything. Hey, I got this health issue. Does that qualify for anything? Let me check. Let me think. Yes. Anything means anything. It says, do not be anxious about, what is, the what, what is that word, church? Anything. Do not worry about anything. But in everything, kind of the same word, anything, everything, right? But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, 
There's that word again, the peace of God. Rest. Rest. And the rest that comes from God, what surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It says, don't be anxious about anything. But I like some of the words in here. It says, but everything by prayer and supplication. You know why I like, I like those words of prayer and supplication in this verse? Because when I pray, the word supplication means to literally to ask God of something. So when I pray and I ask God for help through this struggle, what I am essentially doing, do you realize, I don't know about you, but when I get under, into a bad situation, when I begin to get stressful, do you ever find it interesting that the thing that you should do is the thing that you don't do? Is that just me? I hope not. Because I find myself, when I get into stressful situations, I don't always want to pray. I don't know why that is. Because I'm a fixer. I like to fix it on my own. I don't like to pray. I like to fix things. And when I try to fix things, I, I do a great job of making it worse. I don't know. That's just me. I, I do a great job of making situations worse than what they already are. But it says by everything, my prayer and supplication, what does that mean? That means, God, I am weak. God, I don't got it within me. And I need you to show up and do your thing, God, because you are God and I am not. That's why hey, prayer and supplication are so powerful because it acknowledges that you are weak, but that God is strong. And therefore, you need God. But I also love this word, with thanksgiving. I used to wonder why that was included in there. Because when you pray, hey, ask God for things, but also remember the blessings that you do have. And it puts things into context. Let me illustrate. Earlier this year, or excuse me, um, it was last year, a man and I, um, as a couple, had come into something, nothing between us, but just a situation. We were just asking God to do something um, powerful and miraculous, and we just needed God to come through for us. And we were just praying together, and we were kind of worried about the situation and just kind of just didn't know what to do, didn't know what to turn to, and we were just, I mean, I was in my flesh questioning God's goodness in the situation and questioning uh, what God was going to do. And during the same time frame, um, at my former church that I used to minister to, uh, a couple who were in the Air Force had lost their son. He was, he was a young, I, used to, I babysat him one time. And uh, in fact, if you come to my house, I bought my couch from this couple. Um, and their son had recently passed away, a young child under 10 years old. And then I remember that, and I remember thinking to myself, wow, that really puts our struggles into context. So the things that I was worrying about seemed really insignificant when I remembered the things that I was to be thankful for. I began to thank the Lord. Thank you, Lord, that I have three beautiful, healthy, very loud children. Thank you, Lord, for them, that they are healthy, they get up every morning, and that they can make a lot of noise in my home. And thank you that they can stay up late and not go to bed and ask for water 10 times every night. But thank you, Lord, that I have that blessing. You see how being thankful puts things into context of what you do have? So he says, hey, don't be anxious because anxiousness causes fear and worry and anxiety, which takes away your energy, does it not? But if you will learn to be a person who lifts your burdens up to the Lord and you begin to pray and ask God for supplication and begin to be thankful, hey, let me tell you something. Peace and rest is not something that is a far off. I, I know what it's like. Maybe you're a parent in here thinking, hey, I got little ones. Maybe one day when they get older, I'll find rest. You know what happens when they get older? They begin to drive. Oh, that's anxiety there, right? I mean, I've seen some 16-year-olds behind the wheel. It's not pretty. I mean, there's a reason they put student driver on the back of those cars, because it's not pretty. And to think that one day my little girl is going to be behind the wheel frightens me to death. 
Like, I, I'm stressed out about them. Wait till that happens. And I heard it only gets worse, right, parents of older kids? Like, when they get out of the house, you worry about this, you worry about that, they're married. Oh, man. Finances. Weren't you worrying about your finances 10 years ago? Five years ago? And today? And you think they're going to go away tomorrow? I mean, unless I win the lottery. I mean, if you want to share with me, that's fine. I'll forgive you for playing the lottery. I mean, the rapper said at best, more money, more problems. Peace is not something that's afar off. It is not something for the Christian tomorrow. You see, you know what Israel failed to realize as they're going to the promised land? That God wasn't going to be good to them when they got to the promised land, right? Because I'm thinking, hey, they're walking towards the promised land, and what should have been a short journey turned into a 40-year journey. I have no idea how that works. Must have been women leading the way. I don't know. I don't know. Women driving. I don't Oh, sorry, sorry. That was bad, I know. You can email me later. But as, it should have been a short journey, but I think they were thinking this. Oh, oh God will be good to us when we get to the promised land. Or hey, we'll, we'll, we'll be happy when we get to the promised land. And, no, 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 God was good to them through the journey. God was good to them all along the way. See, happiness and peace and joy for them was not something that was afar off. It was something present for them at that very moment. You see, Christian, peace is not, rest is not something that will come eventually. It is not based upon your circumstances. For the Christian, peace and rest is found today in the present moment. So cling to it. Hold on to it. Learn what it means to have peace with God and learn what it means to have the peace of God. But now I want you to look at verse 11 with me in closing. I know we read it earlier, but I want to look at it again. Verse 11. Because when it comes to this idea of rest, he ends it in a peculiar way, but it stood out to me. It says, let us therefore strive to do our best to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Could it be that the disobedience, or as we talked about last week, the faithlessness in our lives is a result of just the fact that you're tired? You've been weighing your heart and your minds in the things that really do not matter in the grand scheme of things. You've been spending all your energies at work for a promotion that's going to lead you to an even more stressful life. You're living your life for that job, that promotion, that maybe if you get it, wonderful, but you realize that the very day you die, the next day, they're going to put an ad out there to replace you the next day, if not the same day. Where are you finding your peace at? Because could it be that the disobedience or the faithlessness in your life is a result of you just simply not resting? Both your mind, your soul, your body even. I had, I had a call, uh, professor in college tell us one time, it was profound. He said, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do in life is sleep, rest. So the takeaway is this this morning. What are you doing in your life to find rest for your body, your soul, and your spirit? Where? How? Are you taking time to just relax or is your whole life just consumed with this and that and this and that and this and that? No wonder you're getting burnt out. No wonder you say, hey, I don't have time for the Lord. No, no, no. It's because you've been filling it with junk. You say, I don't have time to, to, to make it to church. I don't have time to, to implement the word of God in my life because you've been filling your mind with stuff that's going to steal the joy out of your life. 
there is a rest to be found for the people of God. The Sabbath was, in the, it was commanded in the Old Testament. And yes, we're not commanded it today. But man, we sure better follow it and find rest for our souls. Or you will get burnt out, Christian. Jesus is better. Because in him, there is rest. Let's pray together.